Lord, we've turned our backs on you far too many times. The cost of sin is too much to bear, but still you pay the fine. So I just don't wanna be another person in the crowd. Hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry. And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you. I feel like I've entered into heaven when I'm in your presence. When I'm in your presence. And Lord, please bless this body of your saints with your family. I pray for love and abundant peace for all my enemies And I know that Satan's in there somewhere sitting in the crowd So hear my prayer, Lord, hear my battle cry And I'm so thankful for this intercession with you I feel like I've entered into heaven when I'm when I'm in your presence. No, when I'm in your presence, presence, God. Oh, 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 Lord, I stand in need of your help. So. I'm a warrior of prayer I'm so thankful for this intercession with you I feel like I've entered into heaven When I'm in your presence I'm in your presence, God When I'm in your presence Oh, Lord, I stand in need of your help So, Lord, when I bow down, meet me there Oh, I'm not just praying for self I'm just praying for myself session with you I feel like I've entered into heaven when I'm in your presence oh Lord I'm dirty I'm so unclean God and I'm so unworthy of your redeeming I'm just a sinner On the verge of dying Help me be righteous Save me now I just need to touch Your Him, Jesus Touch Your Him, Jesus Touch Your Him And I'll be saved I just need to touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, and I'll be saved. I'm reaching out 
told me that you'd always be right there. Seems like my problems had one day just begun. Lord, I don't worry no more. They're already one. Said, oh, Jesus, the thing, Jesus, Lord. Good morning, Renaissance live streaming. We are so glad to be in the house of God this morning. We are so thankful for the thousands of you who are tuned in to be with us this morning. We're so thankful that God has blessed us to see yet another day. We want to continue to remember that uh, Renaissance, we're close as we continue to keep in contact one with another. And we want you to know that we miss you as much as we're being missed and we know shortly God will have us back in this place called the Renaissance Church of Christ. To all of our visitors, we're so glad that you're visiting with us. For over the last 17, 18 weeks, we've had thousands of you continuously join in, and we're so thankful for that. We want to continue to pray for you as you pray for us. We want to continue to pray for our minister, continue to keep him in our prayers uh, as he goes about doing the Lord's work, and he's done a great job. We want to pray as well for the leadership of this church. We want to say thank you so much to each of you who are members of this congregation who have continued to be about your father's business, making and ensuring that the work of God continues here at this place called the Renaissance Church of Christ. We're so glad to have you. Remember those that are sick and shut in. Listen, remember to do what we can to let them know that they're not forgotten. Let us pray. Kind merciful Father in heaven, we're truly thankful that you've blessed us with yet this another Lord's Day. We thank you for this opportunity to come to hear your word preach, songs, sung, prayers prayed. We want to give you our best, and we pray, Father, you continue to be in our midst as we do just that. We ask, Father, that you continue to bless us in a special way. But most of all, Father, that we might be the children of God that you would have us to be. And we thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you in your appointed way. For this we ask in Christ's holy and righteous name. Amen. There is beyond the as a blue a God concealed from human sight. He in disguise with heavenly hue and framed the world with His great might. You know there is a God. He is alive. In Him we live and we survive. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. You know there is a God. God. 
God who sun upon a tree alive was willing there to give that he from sin might set man free and evermore with him could live you know there is a God he is alive in him we live and we survive Sing it, call them up, come on 
morning call. Hey, stay right there, stay right there and call. One more time, they didn't hear you call. Just down on my knees, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna tell him what I need, I'm gonna call. He will answer your prayers if you just call. was lost in sin but Jesus took me in and then light from heaven filled my soul oh, it bathed my heart in love and it wrote my name above and just a little talk with Jesus makes me whole come on let us have a talk with Tell him all about our trouble He will hear our faintest And he will answer by and by Now when you feel the prayer for your needs As your heart unto heaven is turning You will find a little talk with the master Makes it all right Come on, sometimes my path seems dream and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. You know the mist of sin may rise and hide the starry sky. And just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Come on, come on, let us have a little talk with Jesus. And let us tell him all about our hope. He will be. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel the breath for your need, as your heart up to heaven is you will, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my path seems dream without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. We gotta say that right You know the mist of sin may rise and hide 
like the starry sky. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Yes, come on, let us have a little talk with Jesus. And let us tell him all about our joy. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. You will, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It's all 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 right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Oh yes, it's all right. 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 Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It's all 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 right. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. It's all 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 right. Makes it right. Just a, just a, just a, just a, just a, just a, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Just a, just a, just a, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. We are grateful to God on this morning for the greatness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at this time, we take a brief moment, yet a significant moment, to appreciate the fact that our Savior hung, bled, and died for our sins. And to that end, we celebrate this morning the Lord's Supper. We recognize that the prophet Isaiah looked down his prophetic telescope. And from that posture, he said, surely he hath borne our griefs. And he has carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And so every first day of the week, we as children of God come together for the purpose of celebrating the efficacy of the death of Jesus Christ. The best died for the worst. He who was in fact a saint died for the sinner. The righteous died for the wretched. And so it is right now, we would ask you to come to his table as we partake of the fruit of the vine and the, broken, and the bread. And we would ask you even now to remember that Jesus took your place. Pray with me right now. Father God in heaven, we ask you to Bless this bread which we are about to partake of. And we ask you to, in fact, bless the fruit of the vine. That as we partake of these two emblems, we will recognize that your son did an excellent work and that he saved me through the sacrifice of himself. And we ask you, O oh God, to allow us to take this with a mind set on him that we would remember what he there did when he there died. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh Lord, oh Lord, our Lord, our Lord how excellent, how excellent is, your name. is your name. Your name is strength. Your name is, name is power. Tower makes me say, I say, Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name, your name is strength. Your name is strength. 
At this time, we're going to, in a very celebratory way, go into our offering. One of the most exciting times in the body of Christ is when we have the uh, ability and when we're given permission and when we're given the opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God. We're mindful that the Bible says, he that soweth sparingly will reap also sparingly, but he that sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. And we believe in bountiful giving so that the kingdom of God is always financially positioned to do the will of God, to spread his word, not only locally, but globally, and to make sure that we are positioned for ministry to serve people who are in fact in need. So even right now, we want you to take this opportunity to click the giving link, either go to renaissancecoc.com and give that way, or you can even text to give. Whatever is your chosen method, we want you even right now to invest in the kingdom of God. We're thankful for every investor that is uh, a part of this church and everyone who's taken the time to ensure that they give to this work. We are thankful because God has positioned us to do some great ministry, um, and we're grateful for what the Lord is accomplishing as it relates to the Renaissance Church of Christ. And so we ask you right now, as generously as you possibly can, ensure that you're investing in the kingdom, for after all, it is in fact more blessed to give than to receive. And so we want you to remember that God is the one who prospers us. And inasmuch as God prospers us, we want to invest back into the kingdom of God. So right now, why don't you give as you have prospered?
I'm gonna trade my earthly home for a better one, bright and fair. Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air. I'll join him in that land where tears or sorrows can be found. When I receive my mansion, I'm a robe and crown. Please give me my mansion. Try to do, but, but one day, day I'll be rewarded with a crown so bright and new. I'll wear, I'll wear, I'll wear a smile, smile so bright for there'll be no cause. One of these old days when I, when I receive, when I receive my mansion robe, we're talking about a mansion, a mansion. Let us give thanks. Almost heavenly Father, we thank you again for just blessing us week after week and day after day and meal after meal and bill after bill and provision after provision. You just continue to bless us and we're just thankful. And we thank you for this moment once again. We feel honored to have the opportunity to show our thanks through our giving. And we thank you, Father, in advance for being Lord over our giving and Lord over every piece of finance that comes through this church. Because we know, Father, that all we need to do is give and you will multiply. We thank you for the increase we've already experienced. We thank you for the increase over the horizon. And we're just so glad that you get all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen and good morning to the Renaissance Church of Christ and all of our friends and our family members who have joined us. Once again, I think this is week 18 or 19. It's one of those teens, but you're still here. And again, y'all, we've had another amazing week. Let me tell you how this week went. This past Friday, wow. We were able to have COVID-19 testing right here to make sure that we keep ourselves physically safe, 
And we just thank Councilwoman, Christian woman, our sister in Christ, Carmelita Gums, for helping us out along that line. And yesterday, what it was, it was a grand day to celebrate all of our graduates. We had to postpone that, but we celebrated our graduates, and we're so thankful to have had the opportunity to do so. And now today, today is our time. Today is our time for you to graduate. And we're so glad that you're able to graduate this morning, that is to advance to that next level through some awesome word, through these songs, through these prayers, through everything that has transpired. And we want to give God all the glory through one more song, and then we're going to give you this message, and you will graduate as well. Amen. So brothers, come on out, and let's give one more before our preacher comes to give us an awesome word. Oh, oh Lord, oh Lord, I've come, I've come to receive, to receive my blessing, patiently waiting, oh Lord, for the harvest, the harvest is set, and I've got that Hebrews 11 and 1, the same kind of faith to know my blessings are coming, oh Lord, I said it's mine, oh
need to know my blessings are coming. Oh Lord, and it's mine. It's mine. Oh mine. Oh Lord, it's all this time. I really love the the Lord. Love the Lord.
why I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. We're grateful that you have taken this time to be here with us on this morning, tuned in and prepared uh, to hear a word from the Lord. We're thankful because God has been better to us than we have ever dared to be to ourselves. And we're grateful because we realize that it is only by the grace of almighty God that we are here even right now. We're grateful for our ministers of music who did a fantastic job always grateful for their ministry and for their deposit into the kingdom of God and we know uh, that these men have been blessed and we're hoping and praying that the Lord will bless their families and bless all that they do we're grateful for the audio visual team that is consistently here as well and we're thanking God for their dedication and we're th thankful for the leadership that is present here as well because we know that this takes a great deal of work in order to pull off this kind of operation. So we're grateful to God for you and we're thankful that you are here. And uh, one of these days I'm going to have them mic me up early so I can sing along with my fellas and, and drop a note or two. Now, praise God, if you don't agree with that, um, don't you tell me because I don't want to be offended. Praise Jesus. But I, I believe that if I join in with them, Praise God. It, it'll be a magical moment, and we're grateful to God uh, for all of these men. Um, we are also thankful for those of you who are visiting with us online, uh, those of you who are uh, maybe first-time comers. We want to say welcome to the Renaissance COC, and we're grateful that you are a part of our uh, ultimate operations and worship service on this morning. So get your Bibles. We ask you to get your family. We want you to all sit in front of the screen, sit in front of the iPad, sit in front of the phone, and get ready for a word from the Lord. A couple of things uh, are going to be taking place that I'm going to tell you about after the uh, worship service, so we want you to just stick around. we got a couple of things happening on campus here at the Renaissance COC as it relates uh, to services that we're offering the community. One of them will be a food distribution that I'm going to tell you more about, and we're going to need some volunteers for that. And so we want as many volunteers as we possibly can. Hear your preacher call for you. Your preacher's calling for you, and we need volunteers to help us with the food distribution, and this effort is being led by Tina Clark, and we are prayerful that you will volunteer so that we can service this community with the food distribution, and we're excited about that. I want to make sure I got the date right. Um, that's why I didn't say the date. Y'all got the date for that? And that's what's sad is they just told me. And so and they just told me, praise God. Say it again. July 18th is the food distribution, and we want volunteers for the July 18th food distribution led by our own Tina Clark. And we're grateful to God uh, for her and for her faith in Christ Jesus. And so be sure you be a part of that. We're also going to have this Friday, I think, COVID-19 testing on site. Um, I believe it is from 10 to 2 o'clock. Uh, 10 to 2 o'clock, I think, is what it is. Uh, but we'll be making, I'm sure it'll be on the screen in just a moment. But we have some COVID-19 testing that's going to be done here. We have partnered with a lab, and the lab is going to be here to conduct the testing. And we want you to get tested to see if you are dating Sister Rona. And we want you to know whether or not that is the case. Uh, we're encouraging everybody to get tested. And um, we know that this is, uh, while I'm making some level of joke with this, we do know it's a serious thing. And we want you to get tested. We want to know, we want you to know whether or not you are um, carrying this virus so that we can adequately address it and that you can take the necessary steps to get better. We do know that the COVID-19 numbers have risen significantly. And we don't take that lightly. So we want to make sure that we give you the opportunity to engage in being tested. And so it'll be right here on the Renaissance site. And we want you to come and do just that. I intend to get tested um, just like everybody else should intend to get tested. Of course, um, I'm trying to see if I can get a customized method. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little finicky when it comes to uh, doctors and stuff of that nature. 
um, and I want a customizable process. Uh, there probably no such thing, but I, I want something customizable because I'm a little squeamish. Some people not squeamish, you know, they can just kind of take. I understand it's painless, but um, I, I'm I'm squeamish, and uh, you know, I want something customizable. I want almost like a I don't know a a, a painless ray of light to touch me, and then it'll tell me if I got it or not. And uh, it's not gonna work that way. No, it's not going to work that way. But praise Jesus. Please come and take advantage of our services as we provide the COVID-19 testing here at the Renaissance COC. So those are the two events coming. Make sure that you are uh, prepared to be a part of those two events in servicing the community. And we just thank God for that. The Oh, the food distribution. Um, make sure uh, that our volunteers, I said this, but make sure you sign up. We're going to create a... Make sure there's a sign-up link that is provided for you. So if we have a sign-up link, uh, we want to make sure that's placed in the chat as well so people can click it and sign up for volunteering. We will all be here for that. I would like you to meet me now in Romans, the 12th chapter. This this is um, a familiar passage. Romans, the 12th chapter is a familiar passage, and I'm going to ask you to meet me in verse 1. I'm going to exegetically treat verse 1 and 2. We will not go beyond verse number two. So we will um, exegetically look at two passages. And in our exegetical look of these two passages, we will extrapolate the thematic thrust that is accentuated by the author so that we can provide an authorial intent interpretation. Now, I know that sounds fancy. It just means um, a verse can never mean what it never meant. That's what we believe. A verse can never mean what it never meant. And we want to make sure that the message of the text is the message of the sermon. Because we believe in teaching God's word. And we want to be consistent with the word of God as we provide you with a practical application. Romans chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse number 1. It is a familiar passage. I'm going to read this from the New American Standard Version at this time. Romans chapter 12. Beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your new American standard says spiritual service of worship. Some translations say, which is your reasonable worship and do not be conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove the will of God, prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I want to read verse two because I'm going to put emphasis there and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed prepositional phrase by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect I want to live for a subject this is part three you were not made to fit in you were not made to fit in and as a subtitle listen to this make sure you stay with me turning away from what I have become Turning away from what I have become. I want to give not only exegetical treatment to the book of Romans and in particular chapter 12. But I want to also be accurate to the theological overtones of the text before we get into a practical application of the passage. What I want to suggest to you is as we go through this series of uh, what we have called self-rediscovery, and as we go through this process of recognizing that within the pandemic, we have been placed on some level of a pause, in which as we have been placed in the context of a pause, we have had a moment where we can reflect on our own lives. And I don't know about you, but each one of us, including myself, has had an opportunity to have self-reflection. I have not had time to reflect on nobody else's life. 
I have had plenty of time to reflect on my own. And one of the things I've learned is some people have a PhD in evaluating everybody else's life, but they don't do as well with evaluating their own life. And what I have uh, been trying to do is evaluate uh, my own life and I have been going down the road of self rediscovery by understanding the notion that I, Orpheus Hayward, uh, or you were not made to fit in. And what we want to make sure you understand is that you were not made to fit in and sometimes we're guilty of trying to fit into stuff we don't belong to. And we've got to be careful that we don't find ourselves trying to fit in to what we don't belong to. Now the way you avoid that is you've got to come up with a proper definition of who you are by consulting with God. Let me reword that because I actually didn't mean come up with. I meant consult with God so that God can tell you who you are and how you ought to define yourself. I have said in previous sermons, one of the worst things you could ever do is give someone else the power to define you. You cannot give anybody the power and the right and the prerogative to give you a definition of you. And I went further than that. You also cannot take the posture of trying to define yourself. So you don't even have the right to define yourself because last time I checked, you did not create yourself. So if you did not create yourself, you don't have the right to define yourself. So I have to consult with my creator that he can help me come to a proper definition of who I am so that I can journey down the road of self-rediscovery. Now, I would admit for some people it is discovery because I could probably take the position there are people who never knew who they were. But I could also take the position some of you used to know who you were and you forgot. And sometimes because you forgot who you were, you need self-rediscovery. Now, some people need discovery. Others need rediscovery. Um, praise the mighty name of Jesus. If I had to make it personal, I am in the process of rediscovery. Um, you may be in the process of rediscovery. Others are trying to discover for the first time who they are because they never thought to ask God. What I'm suggesting is this is your day to ask God. And what I am saying to you is you were never made to fit in and stop trying to fit in to what you don't belong to. Well, what are you doing today, uh, Dr. Hayward? Well, what I want to help teach you today is in your journey of rediscovery, you might find that you got to turn away from what you've become. Now, all of us through the process of life have become something. May I suggest to you everything you've become was not God's design. So you've got to take the position that once I know where I am, I need to figure out how much have I become that was never part of God's plan for my life. I wish you could hear me real careful here. You have lived life. You have had experiences. You have had a family context. You have had hurts. You have had pains. You've had betrayals. You have experienced a loss. You have experienced sin. You have experienced negative situations. You have experienced sickness. Some of you have been uh, assaulted in your, in your confidence. Some of you have gone through moments where somebody ripped down your character. You have had a series of experiences. Listen, think about this now. Every experience you've gone through has caused you to become something. But I want to suggest to you, everything you become was not God's design. Now, once you find out what you become was not God's design, you got to make up in your mind to turn away from what you become so you can be what God intended. 
Now, I'm about to put that into context for you because a lot of us have developed some life philosophies that is not in harmony with God or his word. You, you got some life philosophies. You do it to me, I'm going to do it back to you. Life philosophy. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. Matter of fact, if you've been hurt once, you might tell somebody, I'm going to hurt you if I think you're going to hurt me first. I, I, that's a life philosophy. Life philosophy is I've learned that I can't trust nobody. Now watch this. That's actually not true. But the reality is you can develop that philosophy that nobody can be trusted because of something you went through in your past. And you have become something that God never intended. Are y'all following me? So it's amazing how, and then once you develop the life philosophy, you want God to sign off on what you believe. As if it comes from God. What I'm suggesting to you is, be careful. God don't sign off on all your thinking patterns. And God is not an endorsement, in endorsement of everything you've become. So one of the realities about God is, God will ultimately challenge everything you are so he can bring you back to what you're designed to be. I need you to get that in your spirit. Because what I'm about to tell you today might save your spiritual life. Now let me help you with this. People have gone through traumatic situations. Some people have been divorced. Some people have been molested. Some people have gone through very crisis-like situations that's created thinking patterns. I mean, real crisis stuff. Some people have friends that they thought were friends turned away from them. You never thought that person would be the person that would hurt you. And that stuck with you for the rest of your life. You may be that person who grew up in a home where the dad abandoned the house and you develop a complex about how you feel about your father that now impacts how you operate in your own house because of the experience you had. Some of us have had mothers that have left. Some of us, it, it could just be a host of different things. Your life experiences, your life experiences relationally, your dating experiences, everything thing and is feeding who you are today you've got to learn that when you get with God God will then challenge everything you become from what you have gleaned from life experiences can I help y'all and tell you this real quick there are some life experiences you've had that you misinterpreted and you left with the wrong message but you think you got the right message, but you really didn't. You, there are certain life situations we went through and we came to conclusions without God's assistance. And we've developed a world view based on an experience we misinterpreted. And now you are who you are today. And then you mess around and you meet God. And now God challenges everything you are and challenges you to change what you become this is what i want to talk about i don't know if y'all ready for this i'm only talking to my song leaders and my elder but it's good preaching right here there's some good stuff i feel like there's nine thousand people in here right now it's good preaching because it is interesting when you look at your journey in life i dare you right now before i get to the text look at your life journey and i want you to think about everything you have experienced and how you shaped your thinking around what you experience and what are some of those thinking patterns today and behaviors you shape based on your misunderstanding of something you went through or some of us have been in friend or social environments that gave us mentalities that God never intended. Sometimes your friend circle, your social circle, is often what gave birth to the way you behave today. And then you meet Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm actually not for nothing you are right now. Oh, y'all not ready for me today. I'm actually not for anything you've become. I've given you the grace to survive what you've become, but I don't endorse what you've become. So, what do you want to do today? What I want to show you today is, 
Sometimes in order to get back to who you really are and who you should be, you got to turn away from who you've become. Do you know the hardest person to be honest with sometimes is you? We always talk about lying, you know, don't lie to folk. Well, don't lie to you either. And sometimes people are guilty of lying to themselves. You don't want to be honest with you. And you almost believe that if you tell yourself that lie long enough, it'll be true. And it's dangerous that sometimes we're not honest with ourselves. And when you're not honest with yourself, then you start developing these thinking patterns and behaviors that actually are anti-God and you, you, you've accepted them. So what happens is that we've got to be careful that in order to get back to who we should be, we're going to have to be honest about who we are, what we become, and recognize that sometimes what I am is not what God actually intended. So, what do I have to do? A couple of things, and, and, and I'll repeat this later. Well, I'm not going to do that now. I changed my mind. I'm going to hold that point. What I want to do is first walk you through this text, and then I'm going to give you some action steps to help you get back to discovery, to self-discovery or rediscovery. I want to first deal with the text, help you see this in the text, that you are the product of what you have become and you have become something that is often not in line with God and you are going through right now a process or a journey back to where you should be. Sometimes you've got to assess, oh my God, sometimes you've got to assess how far am I really from God? I didn't ask how close you are to church. Because you attend church is no indication you're close to God. Oh, boy. <laughs> so you attend church, but that ain't, that's really not the measuring rod of whether you're close to God. Don't confuse attending church for meaning or equating to the fact that you're close to God. There's a lot of people who can come to a building and not be close to God. Or there's some people who are watching this sermon. But watching a sermon online does not make you any closer to God than when you were coming to the building. How far am I for real? How hot am I for God? Or how cold have I become? You know, there, there are, y'all are all familiar with our nine planets. Our planets revolve around the S U N the sun it is interesting that Pluto has a significant distance from the sun in which it is one of the colder planets in fact it ain't got no heat it's cold then you got a planet like earth that's close enough to the sun to experience hot and cold. It experiences the seasonal nature. It, it has hot moments. It has cold moments. And a lot of that relates to its positioning to the S-U-N. But then you got a planet like Mercury. That's always hot. It doesn't have cold. And it don't have hot and cold. It's, it's, it's the reality of it is that it's hot. Because it's Mercury, but that's based on where it is in relationship to the S-U-N. What I want you to ask yourself as I go through this sermon is, what planet Christian are you? Are you a hot Christian that's close to the S-O-N? Or are you an Earth Christian that's sometimes hot, sometimes cold? Or are you a Pluto Christian that's just absolutely cold all the time you have no sensitivity to God you have no connection to God I need you to start measuring where are you in relation to the S-O-N I've come to tell you there's some mercury Christians that stay hot because they stay close to the sun but then there's some Christians that you don't know what you gonna get 
I wish I had help like them right along. I, you don't know what you're going to get with this person because they hot sometime, they cold sometime. It just depends on where they are with the S-O-N. Let me tell you something. You got to realize when you interface with some people, you are interfacing with people that have different distances from the S-O-N. And you got to know sometimes I'm Pluto. Sometimes I'm Earth. You don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes I'm Mercury. When you're Mercury... You're hot for God, hot for Christ, hot for Christianity. You are impacted positively in your Christian walk, and it is productive. I need you to ask yourself, what what planet am I on? Well, what I want to help you understand today is when you when you assess where you are and how far you are from the S O N. I need you to ask yourself, what have I become? And what do I need to turn away from in order to get back to how God designed me? Okay, Romans chapter 12 is a familiar passage. Sometimes I don't like preaching familiar passages because sometimes familiar passages give people the impression that they have understanding. At times there are people who can quote a verse so much they think they understand it and until you truly study it you will find that you can quote something that you have misunderstood or perhaps you have not gleaned the full application of that text. Romans 12 is a frequently quoted passage because it is in fact a powerful text. It is a Paulian passage where you get the great theological truths of practical living. The book of Romans is probably one of the greatest didactic epistles that you will find in which the Apostle Paul writes prolifically about the righteousness of God that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will find that preaching in a city like Rome would be anything but uh, anything but easy. And as much as it was filled with paganism, it was the place of imperial power. It was a place of great immorality. It was the seat of criminality. Rome was that place that would be difficult to preach to. Yet the apostle Paul desired to go to the church at Rome and help to accentuate for them his gospel. He had never been to Rome and so he sends this letter ahead of him and hopes to give them introduction to the nature and the essence of his gospel. And you will find that the Apostle Paul in his thematic verse says, I am a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarian, to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am now ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. What is the theme of this book? The theme of this book is the righteousness of God. Not so much the attribute of God's righteousness, but how God places a man in right standing with himself. That is the righteousness of God that is articulated in this book. So what Paul does as he moves methodically through this epistle, he gives us the clear indication that righteousness is needed. Chapter 1 the Gentiles are in sin. Chapter 2, the Jews are in sin. Chapter 3, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Righteousness is needed because no one has been successful to reach God's righteous standard on his or her own. Righteousness is an imputed blessing in which God places righteousness on a man's account not on the basis of his perfection but on the basis of the perfection of his son Jesus and so righteousness is placed on our account so as you move through the book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter 8 he articulates the great truths of the scheme of redemption as it relates to the power of the good news of the gospel which affords us the blessing righteousness now By the time you get to chapter 12, chapter 12 is an articulation of practical righteousness. Righteousness lived. Righteousness manifested. Righteousness is needed. Righteousness is provided. And righteousness must be manifested. Now, with that, Romans 12 says, look at verse 1 in your Bibles. It says, I... 
beseech you, brothers. The word beseech is a word that could be translated urge. I urge you, brothers. Uh, another translation would indicate I beg you, brothers, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Now, I want you to notice, notice he did not say, I command you. He said, I beg you. I urge you. Watch this preposition. By the mercies of God. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'm not commanding you. I could because I'm an apostle. I could because I've been commissioned by Jesus. But I'm not commanding you. I am urging you. I am begging you. And if you want to know the basis of my begging, the basis of my begging is not to command you on the basis of law. But I'm urging you by the mercies of God. Now let me stay here for a moment. God can command you. He can dictate to us our behavior and there are scriptures where there are imperatives but the way Paul writes this Paul says the greatest doesn't say it but he implies the greatest motivation for your change is your acquaintance with God's mercies now I don't know if you notice in the text in this text, the prepositional phrase, by the mercies of God, the word mercies is not singular, it's plural. Whenever God talks about the euangelion, whenever he talks about the good news of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is God's mercies. When I look at everything Christ has done for me I cannot adequately call it mercy singular I gotta call it mercies because his grace is so multifaceted and his grace does so much for me and when I look at everything Christ did on my behalf to bring me justification and sanctification and glorification and salvation and the Holy Spirit. I can't call it mercy singular. I gotta say it's mercies because when I look at the plethora of things that the gospel did for me, I can't call it mercy. I gotta look at it in the plural he's begging me by the mercies of God let me help you understand if you are reluctant to change or to find your way to God's design then my question is how well do you know the mercies of God because God should not have to command you if you know something about his mercies. So the more you know about his mercies, then Romans 12 verse 1 becomes doable. What you want me to do, Paul? Well, just know, first of all, I'm begging you. I ain't going to command you. I could. I'm not going to command you. What I want to know is how much you know about these mercies. What mercies are you talking about? I'm, I'm talking about that Jesus was my propitiation. <laughs> I'm talking about Jesus was my substitutionary sacrifice. I'm talking about the fact that you got forgiveness of sins on the basis of his death. I'm talking about the fact that righteousness is imputed on your account and you didn't have to earn it. I'm talking about the fact that you've been sanctified as God's property made for his use. I'm talking about the fact that God, Jesus, made a way back to God and he broke down the middle wall, that the veil. He ripped the veil so that we have access to God. I'm talking about the fact you are not saved by merit, you're saved by grace. I'm talking about the fact that you've been given mercies and I'm talking about the fact that one day you are on your way to heaven. I'm talking about the 
fact that this mortal is going to put on immortality. I'm talking about the fact that this corruptal is going to put on incorruption. I'm talking about the fact that one day I'm going to have eternal existence in the presence of Almighty God. I'm talking about that in my father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself. I'm talking about the fact that death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? What are you talking about, Dr. Hayward? I'm talking about mercies. I'm not talking about mercy singular. I'm talking about the mercies of God. And Paul said, I'm begging you based on the mercies. Well, Paul, what you want me to do? Present your body. A living sacrifice. Boy, that was that moment. I wish we, I had a whole Baptist church right then. We would have ran around the building. What you want me to do, Paul? Present your body a living sacrifice. How are you going to put living and sacrifice in the same sentence? Because if you're inviting me to look at anything relative to the Old Testament, then last time I checked, if it was a sacrifice, it died. But you have the audacity to give me a theological conundrum where you are now suggesting the notion of a living sacrifice. Living suggests that it's in contrast to necessarily putting something to death. Sacrifice indicates that which is given to be used by God and that the sacrifice represents complete dedication to God's use. Hear me. Whenever they did an animal sacrifice, it was not only about the death of the animal. It was about the animal being given to God for God's use. Y'all got me? So now here's what that means. What you want me to do with myself, God? I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice in that you give yourself to me for my use. You are to be as if you're dead. But I need you to recognize that ultimately give me you for my use. Stay with me. I ain't even got to my sermon yet. Give me you for my use. Now, you already belong to me. But I need you to be willing to surrender yourself because I will never make you do what you don't want to do. So I need you to present your body. Now, when he uses the word body, the word body here, so ma is not necessarily limiting himself to the physical body, but he means the whole self, your body included. Present your whole self as a living sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice does this need to be? Holy. Now, holy means set apart. It means to be consecrated. It means God is saying, that's mine. Sacrifice indicates give it to me for my use. Holiness says it's set apart for my use. All right. So you're a living dedication to God and you're holy set apart for God's use. Holy and acceptable. That word acceptable means well pleasing. Which is your reasonable service. Logikos is the Greek term for reasonable and it means that which includes the inner mind or includes the mind. So logikos means that my service stems from my inner man. My mind is involved with the giving of this sacrifice. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. God is saying when I made you in the garden, you was mine and you left. Now I'm trying to get back what I've always owned. And now that I saved you by mercies, 
I want you to present yourself a living sacrifice. After all, do you appreciate the mercies I've shown? Does God have to beg me to be a living sacrifice if I understand something about his mercies? Oh, God help me. Verse one is what God desires. Present your body a living sacrifice. One way I teach this, I say Romans 12, one is the articulation of the New Testament sacrificial system. Oh, the Old Testament has a sacrificial system. You know, there has animal sacrifices. It had grain offerings. It had all of these various offerings. The New Testament sacrificial system is you. God said, I ain't interested in no animal no more. I'm not interested in no grain offering. I'm not interested in your agricultural offerings. You know what I want? I want you. Present you a living sacrifice. And if you deny me that, I have some questions as to whether or not you understand my mercy. I mean, do I have to command you to be a living sacrifice? Or can you give me you based on the mercies you've received as an act of gratitude? After all, this is your reasonable service. Now, service brings to the forefront the notion of the Levitical priesthood that served in the tabernacle. And just like the Levitical priesthood served in the tabernacle, God has called you and I to be his New Testament priests that we serve in this world. But hear me carefully. You ought not be a priest if you ain't going to bring no sacrifice. There is no such thing as a priest that does not engage in sacrifice. And I've come to tell somebody if I'm going to be a child of God. And if I'm going to be a priest. Then I must bring God the sacrifice. But he's not looking for an animal. He's not looking for grain. He's not looking for agriculture. What are you looking for God? I am looking for you to present yourself a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable which is your reasonable sir. Yeah, Y'all with me so far? Alright watch this. I'm about to start my sermon. Um, verse 2 says I'm in the exegesis of this right now if you, what I'm trying to do today is give you exegesis first the meaning second and the application third so that's, I'm exegesis hey, hey what, is the, what, you, what you should be asking me right now is what does this text mean what does it communicate well I'm telling you what it's communicating this is Paul giving us a practical application of the gospel in which based on the mercies of God, I am being challenged and urged and begged to present myself a living sacrifice dedicated to God, holy, set apart for his use, uh, acceptable, well-pleasing to him, which is my logikos, reasonable service. And this service is not talking about church. It ain't talking about you giving out the Lord's Supper. Man, that ain't no service. That's a chore. <laughs> uh, it's a chore. That's a that's a that's a building chore, a worship chore. Hey, you know, well, I work hard in the kingdom. I ain't never miss giving out the Lord's supper. I'm up here every Sunday. That's we need that, but that don't necessarily indicate you a living sacrifice. Well, you understand, man, I be I lead songs. I'm, not to hit my song leaders, you know, I love y'all. Um, you know, I, I lead songs every Sunday, man. You don't know what, man, you know what I'm giving? Shoot, I lead them songs every Sunday, man. And man, I get up here, I give it all I got. Well, that's good. We need that. But that don't mean that's a living sacrifice. I know. That's not what that means. You know, oh, no, sir. That ain't what that means. No, 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 no. I, I would love to give that to you. you well, brother, hey, would you understand, man? I, I do stuff. You don't see me greeting every Sunday. I stand at the door. Every Sunday, man, at that door, greeting everybody, man. And I'm smiling and hugging folks. I'm a living sacrifice. I don't mean that. I don't mean that at all. You know why I don't mean that? Because the words he used to describe living sacrifice ain't got nothing to do with any of those activities. Listen to it. Present your body a living sacrifice. Holy! That right there ain't got nothing to do with your singing, your greeting, you giving out love. Holy! Set apart to God for his use. And we'll talk about what that is in just a minute. Acceptable, well-pleasing 
which is your reasonable service. Present your body a living sacrifice. I'm going to talk about what that is. We ain't got nothing to do right now. I don't see nothing in here about your singing. I don't see nothing in here about no giving the Lord's Supper. None of that. I don't even see nothing in here about preaching. Look at that. Not that preaching is not important. Preaching is vitally important. It is, it is, a, it is, a, it is a work of God. True. But what, what we're talking about right here. No, no, no. What are we talking about, Brother Haywood? Okay, write this down. If you're on live stream, write it down. What we're talking about right now is three theological terms, really. But the one I want to put emphasis on is conversion. Conversion. All right. You know what conversion is? Conversion is, by definition, an inward change provoked by the Holy Spirit that manifests in outward behavior. It's an inward change provoked by the Holy Spirit that brings about behavioral change. But it's an inward change. Now, mm, conversion happens in three tenses. Just like salvation, just like justification, three tenses. Three tenses. What do you, what do you mean three tenses, Brother Hayward? I mean, let me illustrate it. I have been saved. That's true. The minute I got baptized for the remission of my sins, I could say I have been saved. That's tense one. Tense two. I am saved. That means right now in my present, I am saved, delivered from my sin, which means God has not only saved me from my past and in my past, God is still saving me now. I am saved saved or I can put it this way I have been saved I can also say I am being saved tends to it means you know whether you know it or not all of us are always in process of God needing to forgive us and he's saving me tense three I shall be saved y'all got that I shall I shall be saved means when Christ returns he will ultimately deliver me from this world and from this world of sin. So I am saved. I am being saved. I shall be. Now let me turn to change the word. You have been converted. I am converted. But here's the one we don't realize. You are also being converted. Stop acting like you've arrived. Because God is still converting you. Oh, he converted you. But he's still converting you. And then you got that third tense. He will convert you. That's the ultimate moment when Christ comes back and he completely changes us into our glorious existence. So I am converted. When I got baptized, I got converted. I am being converted. It means God is still trying to turn me from some stuff. Can anybody testify that God is still turning you? I'm in process of being converted. Now this is where my sermon comes in on not fitting in and realizing that I often have to turn from what I become. Do you know one of the hardest processes in the world as it relates to Christianity is not being converted, it's God converting. Because I got some stuff that I have built up in my life. I got some experiences I've gone through in my life. I got some sin issues I've had in my life. And God, although he converted me, he still has to work on me. I'm in process of being converted. God has to often keep turning me to get me back to where he needs me to be. That is what I'm trying to get you to see to, uh, on this morning. I'm trying to get you to see that he's turning. He's turning. He's turning. He's, he, he's constantly in the process of converting. He converted, but he's still converting. I, 
I've developed some stuff in my life. I wish I had two or three. But like I am the sum total of my past experiences. So when I got baptized, I still had to deal with my history of drunkenness. Oh, man. I went down in the water, but I still got to deal with my addiction to pornography. This is stuff I've be. This is stuff I've become. I, 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 I've been, I have to, I've been abandoned by my father a long time ago and I've got issues with my manhood right now because of his absence and I'm still trying to work on what it means to be a man and a good father because I'm still dealing with that past. God is still converting from what I've dealt with. I've been, I've been hurt. My heart's been smashed. I had, I've been in relationships that didn't work well. Now I don't trust being married. I don't want to be married. I don't trust no man. I don't trust no woman. I don't want no relationship. And all of a sudden you can't relate to nobody because you go into the relationship skeptical of everybody based on a past experience. There are some people victimized by your yesterday and the problem is not them in the relationship. Sometimes the problem is where you've been in your past where you can't move forward you can't move on you can't make progress you can't do anything you are stagnated because you are dealing with your yesterday and God wants you to learn how to turn from what you have become he's converting you so when you look at your life right now I need you to ask yourself some questions what have I become and what is God trying to turn me from that I've allowed my life to make me a certain way and how I have been made is not something God endorses and now I am faced with the reality that I ain't just been converted I'm being converted right now he's trying to turn me turn me turn me he's trying to turn me do you know when two Christians because some people, somebody told me one time, you know what, I don't want to ever be part of the church because church folk act just as crazy as folk in the world. I get that a lot. I don't want to be in the church because church folk, church folk just crazy. You know, I'm not too sure I would disagree with that. I, I, would, say, I would say, yeah, that's probably true. We, we are just as crazy. That's true. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Here, here's why that's the case. When folk get saved and they get into Christ, The water of baptism does not erase the experience of past. People bring all that with them. And watch this. When I deal with you and you deal with me, we're often dealing with what we have become that God never designed. You and me are often arguing with what we've become that God never endorsed and we're both trying to get back to where God want us to be and what you don't realize is you got to know when that person in the church is acting crazy or when you acting crazy, we still struggling with what we've become that God is still trying to turn us away from. So how does it happen? Watch this. (laughs) Be not conformed to this world. There it is. Praise God. There's three primary clauses in this text. Verse one has a primary clause, and then verse two has two primary clauses. The first, the second primary clause is be not conformed. Soon schematizo. Soon schematizo means to take on the outward behavior of the world that you're in. Another translation is be not conformed to this world, be not conformed to this age. Well, what do you mean? Be not conformed to the ways of the world. Do not take on the outward behaviors of the world that you are in. And do you not know when you get to Jesus, you want to know, do you know how much of the world you've become by the time you get to Christ? I wish that to it. By the time you get to meeting Jesus and somebody taught you the gospel, you know how much world you got in you? <laughs> you... You know how much stuff is in your mind and in your life at the time you meet Jesus? You have taken on so much of the world. You Surely you don't think God going to take care of that between your going down and coming up out the water. You don't believe that. No, you don't believe that. God changes your state when you go down and you come up out the water. But God takes time to change your character. 
Because you are the sum total of your experience. You know, by the time you get to Jesus, man, you got a lot of world on you. You hateful, you bitter, you jealous, you envious, you a gossiper. Man, y'all not hear me. You can have sexual promiscuity. You have all of this stuff going on that you bring with you. You bring it with you to Jesus. And you bring all that stuff to Jesus and Jesus is looking at you like, boy, there's going to be a job here. This, 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 this ain't going to be no overnight process here. This dude got some stuff. Man, that's what's happening. And then all that world you got on you, man, all the stuff, all the parties you've been to, clubs you've been to, strip clubs you've been to. And, oh, y'all not going to help me along. You, you don't bring all that with you. You, you, don't, you. you know, if you're a young lady, you don't grew up, learned how to be promiscuous. You learn how to dress a certain way. The culture got you looking a certain way. And you bring all that with you to Jesus. All that come to Jesus. And so what happens? Church folk are folk out of the world that's got a lot of stuff on them. God forgave their sin, but he's still trying to change behavior because all that stuff is with you. Bible says that I ain't got time. Ephesians 2 says we were by nature the children of wrath. Do you know you've developed a nature? There's some stuff you do in your behavior that is second nature it's a developed behavior there's some way you got an anger issue man you develop that you learn to be angry you learn that when somebody come at you you feel like the best way is to buck up and be aggressive back because you're under the mindset that aggression is how you meet aggression and you grew up operating that way so you bring that into church and can't nobody deal with you can't nobody get along with you because you still got some stuff you become. You bring all that stuff with you, man. Uh, that it's with you. You was a gossiper before you got in. And then you go in the water, you come out, you still talking about folk mess. As if you got none. It is, it, you bring it with you. you we, we bring it with us. We, oh, we bring it with us. And we got to deal with what we become. There's some, watch this. Oh, God. I got to close. There's some things that people celebrate you for being that God doesn't like. There's some people who champion you and celebrate you for being a certain way that God is actually saying, I am completely displeased with it. And we actually think we're okay because of who celebrates this malignant character. Y'all not going to watch this. Can I, can I give you an example? I'm, prob- I, I am, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty good at telling people off. I'm pretty good at it. Like if I have to express myself verbally, I, I am, you know, oratorically, I can express myself. By the way, got it from my mama. So, so if she's watching live stream this morning, mama, your fault. My mother taught me that. She did. Because my mother's verbal whippings were much worse than her physical whipping. I'm telling you, I'd rather my mother beat me for 15 minutes than to talk to me for 15. Just beat me. Like just... Just because when she get finished with me, she has got all through my psyche. I'm, I am mentally bruised. So I develop from watching my mother and others that when a person challenges me a certain way, I verbally go on the assault. And I've learned. It. But then here's the thing. When I've, I've done it so much that there are people that like it. They'd be like, oh, snap. He about to tell them off. Watch this. And they celebrate it. And so what you do, you get amped up like, yeah, I'm going to make sure this is a good show. I wish I had two or three. It, you, you, you're fat. People celebrate some of your malignancy and then you think that's cool. Y'all are not hearing me. There, there are some, and I've seen this in young people. There are some young people who celebrate promiscuity, promiscuousness. And you're celebrated as a male based on how many women you can sleep with. And it, it you not, and you, and it's celebrated. While well, God is saying, no. So, or, or you, you celebrate a certain sexuality as a male, and you use women as counts. Y'all not gonna hear me. And then you saw, and, and that somehow becomes a definition of manhood. And we get it celeb- and we get celebrated for it. There are some fathers that celebrate their son's first encounter with sexuality prior to marriage. 
Y'all, y'all, y'all trying to tune out on It's celebrated. Or a young lady who learns how to dress promiscuous and celebrated about her body. And she likes to be celebrated for how she looks. And so she feeds that. She learned it at a young age. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Young girls, even within my own family. Who I'm learning, they are learning to like the compliments they get for the sexuality displayed. I'm careful with my daughter because she's in that stage where now she wants to serve curvature. So she will go to the store and we start purchasing stuff. She pick up a real short. She'll pick up a shirt that soles half her stomach. That's kind of fitted to the chest. Because now she's starting to have certain curvatures and she'll say, Daddy, I'm ready to go. I'm like, let me see what you got. Because when she going to the counter, she's carrying the clothes. All she want daddy to do is pull out the wallet. Y'all not going to help me along in here. And she don't expect me to ask no questions. But before we get to the counter, I said, baby, let's go one by one. What you got? And she's like, daddy, we don't have to do that. I'm like, yo, yes, we do have to do that. And she want to get these tight little stretch pants now because she's starting to get a little hippie. And I'm like, oh, 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 wait, hold tight. That we're not buying. Because she's impressioned by what she sees. And she's learning that sexuality gets certain attention. And so now she'll sneak in her bathroom and she puts on certain stuff. And I know she got a little FaceTime this and this, that. And so I, I got to watch now. Who, who you talking to? Because that was not just telephone calls. Now they can get on screens. Y'all not hearing me up in here. So, so she can buy. My thing is, why you buy, why you want these clothes so bad? We in pandemic. We ain't going nowhere. Who gonna see it? Y'all not gonna help me along in here. So I gotta watch. I gotta be careful. The, it, it, praising my name of Jesus. I gotta watch. Her friends have a certain speed. I, I gotta be careful what I'm saying because this, this is public. But um, you, you know, I went, I went to a gathering with her one day. My baby, you know, my baby's pretty. My baby's beautiful. And, and she, I had to watch who was in her circle. I started watching who she was hanging with. And then at, at the time, thank God I don't remember the girl's name. It's probably a nice girl. She, she, she was walking with a girl and, and the girl's shorts was way up high showing parts of her backside. And my daughter and her were real chummy. Wait a minute. So I watched the whole time from the bleachers like a daddy, like a Bible says in Psalms 121, uh, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it, except the watchmen watch the city. I was watching the city. I was watching the city. I just uh, looking. I said, let me see where this is going. And I watched her. Praise God. Cause that's my baby. And I watched her and this girl dressed real promiscuous with the short, 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 shorts on. And then they went to the restroom. But I had told my daughter, don't you let, I said, stay in my sight. Don't go in no buildings. But daddy's on the bleachers. And she knew that's where she left daddy. So she didn't think daddy was going to see where she was going. But I was watching. Because a watchman watched the city. Y'all going to help me along in there. I'm probably taking that out of context. But it's right right now. A watchman going to watch the city. And I saw them go in a building. And I, then I said, hmm, they went in a building. And so I called her phone because a watchman watched the city. And I said, baby, where you at? I'm, you know, just, just calling to check up on you. Now, I knew where she was. I knew what building she went in. I watched the whole thing go down. And then praise God. Uh, she said, yeah, daddy, I'm right over here, you know, outside the door. She went outside the door. So daddy was a watchman watching the city. I came off the bleachers. And I went over to the building that they was in. And then when I went in the building, I noticed she wasn't in the lobby, but I saw two bathroom doors. And I heard some talking in the bathroom doors. I went and I called out, hey, where you at? And then she came out the bathroom door. I said, what you doing? She said, I was just in the bathroom. I said, no, you weren't just in the bathroom. Where I told you to be? You, you told me, you, you told me, no, 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 you, 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 no, no, we don't speak in tongues in this family. Where are you supposed to be? See, I have to watch who. What are you doing, Brother Haywood? I'm watching what she might become. And you got to watch what's happening in this world because your children are in process of becoming. That one day they may have to turn from what they become. What are you saying, Brother Haywood? 
Let me finish this quickly. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. The word transform means metamorpho means change from the inside out. By the way, the verb is in the passive, which means God is the one who's got to change you. Now, you take on the behaviors of the world, but God's the one that's got to help you take it off. You have to go through a metamorpho and inside out change. Watch this preposition by the renewing of your mind. Do you know how much the world has impacted my mind? And guess what you got to do? You got to weed through everything the world has done to your mind that has made you embrace the schematics of the outward expressions of behaviors. God wants to change you by changing your thinking because that takes time. You can never get back to where you should be until you change the way you think that, that will then give birth to new behavior that is promoted and motivated by the Holy Spirit. And so, what are you saying to me, Brother Hayward? I'm saying, if you're trying to get back, it's time to turn from what you've become. Two things. As I used to do, um, young man, I used to leave food on a plate for days. Mother hated it. My mother said, bring the plate down, but she would try to, you know, back in the day to use a Brillo pad. She couldn't get it off. So she would have to fill up the sink with hot water and let the dish um, soak. And it needed to stay there for hours. But the longer it stayed in that environment, what was stuck to it started to slide off because she put the dish in an environment that was designed to give it change. As long as that dish was upstairs with that food on it, it would have kept accumulating food to stick to the plate. And sometimes even a Brillo pad can't get it off. But if you soak it in an environment that's designed to help get that stuff off. Then you'll find it's easier to remove dirt. When it is in the environment of hot water. Come here. If you don't learn how to soak in the word. Don't dip in and out of it. If you learn to soak in it. There's some stuff that's been sticking to you. That will come off. If you learn how to soak in the word of God. Some of us are teabag Christians. See a teabag Christian. You know some people don't like their teabag to soak. They just dip it. It's in and out. And sometimes as children of God. We are in and out the word. And expect to change. How are you going to change if you keep going in and out? Well, what do I need to do? Do like your mama did to the dishes. Soak. Stay in the word so we can renew your mind. And so as I close, if you want to be a child of God, I want you to do that right now. If you want to be a Christian, I want you to watch this. Be converted. But after you get converted, I want you to submit to consistent being converted in the sense of let God have the process of converting you. You got to submit to the process of converting after he has converted. And there's some things you got to turn away from. I need to turn away from what I've become. And if you're here right now, I want you to do that. We're going to pray in just a moment and we're going to sing the song of invitation and we pray and we hope that this message will help you to start making your way back to what God designed you to be and turn away from what you've become. Even right now, I'm going to ask our ministers of music to come forward. 
as we get ready to sing. If you want to be baptized, I want you to come do it right now. If you want to be a Christian, come do it right now. Come do it right now. Be like yeah, 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 yeah. The Lord will perfect that yeah, concerning. Yeah. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. And sooner, sooner or, later, or later, it will turn. It's turning my face. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's turning Praise around. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's turning it's around. It won't always. It won't always be. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. The Lord. The Lord will perfect that. Concerning. Concerning. Yeah, yeah. Sooner or later. No, sooner or later. It will turn. It'll turn in my favor. In my favor. It's turning around. It's turning around for me. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. It's turning around for me. One more time. It won't, it won't always, always be. It won't always be like this. You can do it. You can turn. You can turn. You can turn. Yeah, 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 yeah. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. I know, I know that sooner or later, sooner or later, sooner or later it will. Praise Jesus. Yeah. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. We're going to pray for you right now. If you're on the live stream, we're about to go into a prayer. My prayer is for your journey to turn away from what you've become to make your way back to God. Self-discovery. I'm going through it. I hope you're going through it. I hope you are dealing with the fabric and tapestry of your own life and realizing how God has designed you. Next time I'll be dealing with discovering your giftedness because there's some things that God has called you to do and you can you are the only one that can do it like you do. And I want to help you discover your giftedness. Pray with me. Father God in heaven, we're thankful and we love you. Thank you, O God, for this word. We hope and pray that we will receive it in such a way where we will implement and put to practice. We're thankful because you're a God of grace and we thank God for your mercies. We thank you for all of the mercies you've given Father, you have been a tremendous God, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. Father, every child of God listening under the sound of my voice, we ask you, God, to give them what they need in this journey of change so that they can continue to move in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we promise to give you all the honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. Do we have any announcements? All right. Amen. Let the living rooms and dens and dining rooms say amen. Got to be a good feeling just to have some some real preaching, just real talk preaching. We thank Brother Orpheus Hayward uh, for delivering and allowing God to use him yet again week after week. We thank you for that amazing message. We have just a few announcements. Uh, First of all, let's talk census time. The 2020 census for the Renaissance Church of Christ. We'll put that slide up so we can talk through this particular item. Uh, Don't be lost in the count. Please participate for all of our members in the Renaissance 2020 census survey. We have a due date of July the 26th. It's just as simple as going to renaissanceclc.com forward slash census. 
It's very important because we are repurposing and we are rebranding ministry and how we do things. And you being in that number is going to be so critical to that work. Next, uh, we are excited about this upcoming Saturday as we have our first community. This is the Renaissance Church of Christ Community Food Drive. We are running this food drive. Good people, we need volunteers. If you please look uh, on this slide, uh, we're asking you to register at renaissanceclc.com forward slash food drive. We desperately need volunteers for this particular event, and we want to thank you in advance. So you can go to renaissanceclc.com forward slash volunteer in order to sign up. And that is necessary in order to meet all CDC guidelines. So again, if you're able to volunteer on this day, renaissancecoc.com forward slash volunteer, and then we can have all hands on deck. We want to thank you in advance for your sacrifice of service to make it happen. Next, we're excited about having new members. Yes, we are virtual. We will still want to celebrate all of our new members. So we have our new member celebration uh, it is coming up on July the 18th as well from 6 to 7. Here's the Zoom meeting ID or the dial-in number. We are thankful for everyone who's become a part of the body. And while I'm on this particular slide, I do want to report to you that this past Lord's Day, we had two baptisms. We had someone in the parking lot during service, and then after service, somebody else got into the water. So we just praise God uh, for those members who are added to the body of Christ. We look forward to sharing with you their names and their beautiful faces next week. And last but not least, we are in our summer quarter. We started our summer quarter of Bible classes. If we can put up our Bible class slide. All you have to do, all you have to do is go to renaissancecoc.com forward slash Bible dash class dash online, and then you can join via Zoom. It's as simple as a click. So that is every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. and, of course, Sunday after worship. So speaking of that, we look forward to all of you staying tuned, going to this website, and joining us for Bible class. We thank you again for being a part of our services this Lord's Day. And we'll now turn it over to one of our elders, Brother Robert Wilson, to give us a closing prayer. God bless you all. Again, we want to say thank you to Dr. Orpheus J. Hayward for a fine message this morning. We are truly have been blessed by the word of God that we might be transformed. We thank God so much for this day. We continue to ask your blessings upon all of us everywhere as God moves, as God always does. May we all bow and pray. Kind of Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for the gift of life, health, and strength. We thank you for the power and the magnitude of your word. We thank you for the word that was preached we pray for your manservant, Dr. Orpheus J. Hayward. Continue to bless him in a special way. Continue to be with his father as we go out through the rest of this week. Watch over us. Keep a hedge of protection around us. So we might be blessed to be able to come back at the next appointed time. For this we ask in Christ's holy and righteous name. Amen. Oh, Lord, I'm dirty. I'm so unclean, God. And I'm so unworthy of your redeeming pal. I'm just a sinner on the verge of dying. Help me be righteous. Save me now. I just need to touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, and I'll be safe. I just need to touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, and I'll be safe. I'm reaching out to you, my Savior. 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 I just need to touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, Jesus. Touch your him, yeah. I 
just need to touch your heel, Jesus. Touch your heel, Jesus. Touch me. Touch your heel, Jesus. 
Jesus, touch your hand him and I'll be safe. I just need to touch your hand.